We're living in a world where there are more problems than solutions. A raging pandemic, climate change, aging, cyber breaches, the list goes on. My name is Ching Shu Yi, and in this series, I and fellow millennial Jermaine Tan will be meeting people our age who think they've got the answer to these problems. Let's do it! Physics himself must fade. All things to end are made. The plague, full swift goes by. I am sick. I must die. Thomas Nash, an English playwright who wrote that sum 400 years ago during the 1592 London Plague outbreak. Edward Munch drew the famous self-portrait in the 1919 Spanish flu. And Shakespeare apparently wrote King Lear during his quarantine. And all I did was made a few TikTok videos during summer break. But I'm about to turn that ship around. I am Shui, a theatre actor, and for the next couple of weeks, journalist. They say a crisis breeds innovation. In this episode, I'm going to meet the people in my generation who have been very busy innovating during this pandemic. I'll be a human guinea pig, check out some cool AI that watches my every move, and even learn how to kill germs with something that's free and plentiful in Singapore. That looks very questionable. And together with these young innovators, I want to figure out how to stop a pandemic. Let's, Let's go. do it. Yeah. Wuhan, China. The first reported case of a person infected with the new coronavirus was identified here in December 2019. More than a year later, COVID-19 has taken over the world and pretty much changed it. But it's hardly the first to do that. The bubonic plague in the 14th century killed over 200 million people or a third of humanity. But it's also when we discovered that quarantine was a good idea. The biggest pandemic of this century, the Spanish flu in 1918, took about 50 million lives. But it inspired countries to make healthcare available to the masses instead of the privileged few. So it looks like pandemics have been the mother of invention. But since the Spanish flu, there have been four pandemics in the last 100 years. That's one in every 20 years. The International Monetary Fund thinks that the best way to contain a pandemic is to test and isolate on a much bigger scale than where the world is at right now. Are swab tests the only way to detect the virus? Or is there a faster way to test for COVID-19? Hi, I'm here to get myself tested. Use this. I was actually expecting a very uncomfortable swab to be shoved up my nose and not an inflatable bag. That's it? All done. Basically, with this breath bag, uh, we attach it to a mass spectrometer that will suck out the air from this bag and we will analyse it. Wow, that sounds easy. This COVID-19 breathalyzer is thanks to a team of 20-somethings who want to change how we diagnose infectious diseases. They created Breathonics, a local startup in 2019. And 25-year-old Wayne Wee is one of its co-founders. So how does this work? I will uncap it and uh, set this. Okay. And then the mass spectrometer will actually measure concentration of the volatile organic compounds in the breath. So there's almost a thousand different uh, volatile organic compounds, also oh, wow. known as your VOC biomarkers. We found that there are certain VOCs that, um, that relate with the COVID-19. Our machine learning algorithm is the one that will do the analysis and then to see whether is it a positive or negative. How long does the test normally take? From breath collection to you getting a result, the whole process takes less than a minute. Only one minute? Yeah, that's right. There are two ways Singapore uses to test for an active COVID-19 infection. The antigen rapid test or ART 
and the polymerase chain reaction test or PCR test. Both tests use samples taken from the nose or throat. The PCR test is the gold standard, but it takes at least 12 hours to get results. It's more expensive and needs trained professionals and specialized equipment. Is this as accurate as the PCR test? Based on our clinical trials, it shows that there is a very promising result of over 90% accuracy. Comparing that to the PCR, which is about 95%, so it's actually pretty accurate. Does this result tell me that I have COVID-19? You just go to our web app and then you upload and then you just click this and then ta-da, so you're negative. <laughs> hey, I don't have COVID-19. Yay! So actually we have two sampling methods. So one of it is the breath back method, which is what you did earlier. Yep. And the other one is the direct breath method. Can you show me? Yeah, sure. Okay, this is the disposable one-way valve mouthpiece. Blow into it. Yeah, that's all. That's it? That's even faster than that. Yeah. <laughs> so why then do you guys use the bag? Where uh, people need to be like uh, socially isolated or they are potentially contagious. Right. So in those cases, you might want to use the bag. So when will this be used to test the whole of Singapore? Currently, we are not looking to test the whole of Singapore, but it's more to test, for example, checkpoints when people are coming in and out of Singapore. We are still doing more tests because we want to improve the algorithm, improve the accuracy. Until testing can be as easy and as cheap as while well, breathing, we still have many, many rules in place to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. Stand at least one meter apart. Wash your hands with soap thoroughly and regularly. And keep your social life a little less social. But people are feeling a little tired of following the rules. In recent months, groups of partygoers got into trouble for flouting social distancing measures. Twenty-six-year-old Vishnu Saran is trying to make sure that our pandemic fatigue doesn't get the better of us. Hi, are you Vishnu? Yes, that's me. Hi, Hi. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Shui. So this is actually Invisible Shield. What we are doing is uh, using this to identify COVID-19 non-compliances. It's our way to help Singapore in its fight against uh, COVID-19. Yes, like me, not wearing a mask. <laughs> Usually how we do this is deploy IP cameras around factories, uh -huh. industrial areas. Then we send alerts to security guards. Okay, let's go spy on someone. <laughs> let's let's go. do it. Yes. Usually, the Invigilo Shield platform would analyze a live feed. But for today's experiment, we're downloading the videos we shot of the area. There's so many violations. It's a canteen after all, so you get to see like how people are not wearing masks. We started off as mainly on construction safety, uh, using similar technologies to identify hazard. Uh, since COVID-19 happened, that's where we realised Invisible Shield would be a lot more useful. Basically helping security enforcement, not just mask detection, but also social distancing. Does that mean that anyone can use this technology? We actually got a lot more interest from hotels, mm. public places, uh, even shopping centres. I really don't like the idea of a robot watching my every move and tattling on me. It's a little creepy, but what if there's a robot that's keeping tabs on me in another way. In a pandemic, our hospitals are overwhelmed with the number of cases and the increasing number of patients. But I'm going to meet with someone who's working on a solution to make sure that this doesn't happen. So this is the Power Vital HF solution. Okay. So this one including a mobile app and a variable sensor. Geng Bo helped start Bioformis in 2015 to help sick people receive medical care in their homes. So basically it kind of tracks the person's health and history? Yes, when you wear the device, uh, your vital sign will show oh, up. Oh, okay. So do I have to wear this 24-7? We recommend you to wear it as long as possible, including uh, daily uh, activities, uh -huh. exercising, even sleep. When COVID-19 struck last year, their BioVitals platform was adapted to help healthcare workers around the world safely monitor their patients remotely. 
COVID-19 patients with mild and moderate symptoms can then stay home so that hospitals are not overrun. To help me understand how the biosensor works, I'll be wearing it and completing a fixed set of activities every day. So you have six tasks to finish by the day. Here you can see, uh, take your medication and you can record your blood pressure, mm -hmm. record your weight. And there's a six minute walk test. Yes. Shall we do that now? Sure, no problem. I'll be wearing the biosensor for the next two weeks. So today is day one. I'm on my way home and I'm still wearing the device on my arm. The info from my daily activities will allow healthcare workers, no matter how far they are, to keep a close eye on my health and well-being. Hey guys, it's day 10. I just did a 40-minute HIIT workout. So my heart rate right now is 154 BPM. Oh, Bioformis is calling me. Are you exercising? Yes, I was, I was. Uh, the exercise, you can see your heart rate uh, increased. And also yes. your activity and set intensity increased. Uh -huh. And also I can see it's like you are kind of jogging or walking. So you're yeah. tracking me now, is it? Nah, just for monitoring purpose. <laughs> Make sure you are safe. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Hi, so it's day 14. So I'm on my way to the Bioformis office. Um, I'm very excited to find out what my vitals for the past two weeks have been saying about me. So let's go check that out. If you look at all your physiological signals, uh, including temperature... Oh, it actually measures my skin temperature. Yes, it uh, measures multiple things. Your oxygen saturation, mm -hmm. which is very important for COVID-19. It also has things like blood pulse wave, uh, the stiffness of your arteries, cardiac output, uh, stroke volume, etc. It's a great screening tool to quickly isolate a patient and get them a swab test. Looks like uh, you did some activity today and uh, anything about 120 would have flagged an alert and your heart rates were around 140. Because the algorithms knew that you were doing an activity, so there was no alert. We have shown in studies that we can reduce readmissions by over 70 percent and the overall cost of care by over 40%. Uh, and, and this is uh, completely revolutionary. We were able to predict COVID-19 complications 21 hours in advance. Has there been any pushback from, say, the public that there may be a fear yep. against no, think data security? We make it very transparent to the patients on what data is collected, how it is stored and how your healthcare providers are eventually going to use the data to uh, you know, take care of you as a patient. I can see how the biosensor would be very helpful for patients and the healthcare workers. But to me, it's still just another device that can track and dare I say it, spy on us wherever we go. Maybe there's another way to stop this pandemic that doesn't need me to give up every shred of my privacy. This is definitely a fun way to socially distance. Every moment of every day, we are surrounded by pathogens. Bacteria, viruses, parasites, and even some fungi that if they enter our bodies, can make us very, very sick. Cross international borders and voila, you have a pandemic. Some pathogens you don't even catch from direct contact with other people. They can be spread through water, through food, through airborne particles, or when you touch a surface that's also been touched by an infected person. Vinayak Gate wants to kill these dangerous hitchhikers before they make it into our bodies by using a resource that is all around us, light. So how does Safe Light actually work? Safe Light actually targets light-sensitive compounds naturally present inside the microbes. 
These are called porphyrins, and once excited by the right kind of light, these porphyrins lead to the generation of reactive oxygen species and lead to the generation of toxic molecules that ultimately bring about cell death. So what we are doing in essence is using something that is naturally present in the bacteria to bring about their own death. So the safe like kill all types of bacteria? Indeed. Foodborne pathogens, pathogens found in hospital environments, even fungi like yeast and molds. And so far we have found it to be effective against a diversity of microbial species. In fact, what we have seen is that it can also work against antibiotic resistant bacteria. Many of our pandemics like Ebola and SARS were caused by viruses. But bacteria have also wreaked havoc. The Black Death wiped out a third of Europe in the 14th century. That was bacterial. Tuberculosis, another bacterial scourge, has killed more people over the course of history than any other infectious disease. And according to the WHO, bacterial resistance to antibiotics is rising dangerously high as we speak. So how do you guys know that this actually works? Why don't we do an experiment to find out? Sure. Let's go. We have two door handles right here. The top one with safe light and the bottom one without any light inside. And what we are doing is artificially contaminating both of these. And we'll be switching on the light and starting the experiment, which will last roughly two hours. Nowadays, that's the recommended cleaning frequency for high touch point. Why do you guys choose door handles as your prototypes you're working on? If you look at any microbiological surveillance data, you'll find that there are certain hotspots where they are concentrated more than in other places. Things like toilet seats or wash basin, tap faucets, and then the handles, and also elevator lift light buttons. So by focusing our lights on these microbial hotspots, we believe that we can achieve a greater efficacy and bring about a greater reduction in the germ. After a two-hour wait, both the door handle fitted out with safe light and the one without are swabbed. Okay, I'm done. I'm going to put it in the incubator. The samples are then incubated for 24 hours to allow the bacteria to bloom. Okay, look guys, this is what we have 24 hours later. Oh wow, so this one is the safe light and this is without. Yes, what, are, what are the dots? So individual black dots here represents a bacterial colony. Whereas for safe light, you can see since the bacteria died, there is no black dots here. Safe light could help us stop or slow the transmission of bacteria and the diseases they cause. But there's something else that's spreading dangerously fast. Fake news. Fake news about the virus has led to mass poisonings in Iran, mob attacks in India, and burning of phone masks in the UK. According to one study, fake news about the virus has sent more than 5,000 people into hospitals worldwide. I'm here at the Badok Town Centre. How good are Singaporeans at spotting bad info? Drinking alcohol may kill the virus. Is it true or false? False. Maybe. Maybe. False. I don't think okay. so. Okay. Poultry eggs are contaminated with coronavirus. I think so. False. Coronavirus created in the lab. Do you think it's true or false? No. True? This one I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's en engineered. After hearing all their answers, I think you don't know what is true, what is false, whether it's an actual factual article. One topic that's rife with misinformation vaccines. Vaccine skepticism, fueled by fake news, is putting a dent in vaccination plans against COVID-19. Could this battle against the pandemic hinge on winning the war on fake news? I heard about this roadshow some local doctors have put together to bring their expert advice to the community. Why do you want to do a vaccination myth-busting session? The main reason why people are not taking up vaccinations, they might be worried about side effects of the vaccines. They are worried, you know, they have like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and are they safe to undergo such vaccination? We hope that with such a root show, we can actually help to increase the vaccination uh, take-up rate. Yeah. So how often do you guys do such events? We actually don't do this often. We usually do this uh, online. 
Us Doctor is the brainchild of two 28-year-olds, Brian Toh and Dinesh Gunasakaran. So what was your inspiration for Us Doctor? In my family, I had to uh, constantly search for health information for them. You know, what food they can eat, what the side effects of certain drugs. Because I couldn't find reliable, consistent health information online, I often had to resort to uh, calling a physician friend. That physician friend is actually seated right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> So can you tell me a little bit on how to use the platform? So for example, let's dive into the coronavirus COVID-19 space. Currently we have questions and articles. And so you're able to look for questions you never thought of asking before. Start learning more about the condition itself. What a lot of doctors do is they're trying to put out different sparks of misinformation already in their own network through uh, different mediums like instant messaging or social media. What we're really trying to do here is to amplify that for them, scale it up for them and centralise it for them. So do you think that Ask Doctor or this platform could compete with misinformation out there? Because fake news do spread pretty fast. Um, we don't know if this is going to be a one hit you know, solution that's going to solve the whole problem of misinformation, but we need to start taking steps to address it. So when someone's searching for information online, we don't want them to go to unreliable websites. This was critical during COVID because we had patients with, for example, minor injuries, and they were asking, you know, do I need to see a physical doctor for this, or can I see someone online? And then that will require some conversation, find out more about what's going on, and then direct them to the right source. Ask Doctor is one of the few platforms in the world that offers direct access to doctors online for free. But in this battle against medical misinformation, social media giants like Twitter and Facebook are furiously flagging and taking down posts that lie or mislead the public about the pandemic. So I guess it's a start. There's no silver bullet in eradicating infectious diseases. Not even a vaccine that's 100% effective. In all of human history, we have only managed to completely stamp out one disease, smallpox. But we can definitely put an end to a pandemic. We have to put up enough barriers to stop the spread. Universal testing, disinfecting services, and physical distancing. But each of these barriers will inevitably have holes in them. But if we put up enough barriers and make sure the holes don't line up, we can break the chain of transmission enough to stop a pandemic.